Uh, my name is Kevin again, and I'm going to talk about the Tidyverse Primer chapter. Um, so to start off, I'd just uh, talk a little bit about these learning objectives that John uh, listed out here for us. So um, we're going to talk about the Tidyverse design principles, because a lot of, you know, like tidy models, as you can imagine from the name, uh, builds on and uses the same principles um, in designing this kind of modeling package, you know, of a group of modeling and, you know, um, machine learning and, you know, all these data cleaning, all those, all these packages and the kind of the tidy models verse um, kind of use a lot of the same principles. Um, so we'll talk about that, uh, explain, we're we'll talking a little bit about uh, what it means for the tidy verse to be designed for humans. Um, a little bit about design thinking uh, and then uh, kind of talk about each of the design principles and show walk through some of those examples that are in the chapter. Um, so we're reuse, reusing existing data structures, uh, being designed for the pipe, uh, designed for functional programming, um, as well as talking a little bit about tibbles because those are uh, commonly used in uh, tidy models uh, for a lot of different purposes. And um, also talk a little bit about the tidyverse in terms of uh, reading and wrangling data, which it really excels at. Um, so before I actually go into this, I just wanted to kind of start at tidy model or tidy, uh, the concept of having tidy data, because uh, it's kind of what all the different packages in the tidyverse, uh, uh, kind of the same type of logic, you know, that they all kind of operate under. And having tidy data, data is really, uh, you know, often necessary in order to work with functions in the tidyverse. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, which I'm, I think probably a lot of us are, but um, uh, just to have a common set of understanding here, um, in tidy data, uh, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, and each um, uh, type of observational unit forms a table. And so I thought this was a nice vignette here because it shows a couple of examples uh, where you have what's considered tidy data and like untidy data. Um, so if you can see this table here in the middle of my screen, um, you have a data frame or CSV file, right? That we've read in as a data frame um, that has a bunch of columns. Uh, but um, one characteristic of this, of this table is that you have values in your column names. And so these aren't really variables. Um, they're, they're people's names that we've, uh, made into column names and that that really uh you know isn't uh in line with some of those principles that we just talked about and so one way of, of making it tidy into tidy data is to um, make it longer um so a lot of the time tidying up data is moving from wide to longer um using uh often these pivot longer functions um uh, pivot longer function. And so as you see, a, a kind of tidy version of that data set, right, has a name column, um, the assessment they took and their grade. Um, so every column now represents a variable um, and every uh, row, it, you know, is a combination of those variables representing an observation. Um, and so pretty much any set of, uh, any package you use in the tidyverse will, uh, you know, it'll make your life a lot easier if you have data in that format, including something like, you know, plotting um, your data in ggplot. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, and, and just one note is that when I started learning R, uh, I was told to use base R as much as possible. And I really did not like R for a while <laughs> with, with that kind of advice. Um, and, uh, and I started watching David Robinson's talks about the Tidyverse or Tidy Tuesday, sorry. And, um, and he would kind of walk through his code and his process without ever seeing data and kind of explore it and model it in, in about an hour. And, um, and I was just blown away by, you know, the process in with Tidyverse type packages of, of basically moving from an objective and thoughts about what you want to do into action with, uh, you know, implementing it in code and the Tidyverse really makes that, I, I think, pretty seamless. Um, so um, one of the uh, main design principles that, uh, in the Tidyverse is this idea of designing for humans. Um, and when I think about this, it comes back a lot 
for me as a process uh, design thinking. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, just basically it's an iterative process of, of you know, if you're trying to build something for someone, you want to first kind of understand where they're coming from, understand their uh, experience, um, their successes and challenges, their, their goals, their, their knowledge about what they're doing. Um, and then you kind of, with that in mind, define like a problem statement, brainstorm solutions, test them and iterate through those tests until you have something that, that's helpful for them. And, and part of that, when we're talking about like programming, um, is like, um, uh, you know, or, or the kind of consequence of that process and programming is, is how do you set up a language in terms of the syntax, in terms of how you name functions. Um, and ideally you wanna make kind of that process of going from thoughts to action and code as seamless and frictionless as possible. Um, and so uh, one reference that they had, and I was looking through the Tidyverse uh, book that I, I link at the end of the chapter here, um, this review and this further reading section um, that talks about, they talk about this idea of Norman doors. And so if you have a chance later, I would, well, it's like five minutes, I would watch it. Um, but the basic idea here um, is, uh, is that there's things in, in the world like uh, doors, uh, oftentimes where you you think that they that you're supposed to do one thing based on how they're designed, or that they're capable of doing something. Then you go try to do that thing, and, and it doesn't work out. And so, uh, with doors, a lot of the time, and actually, I should have taken a picture of this because I was in a coffee shop uh, like last Friday, and on the way out, there was a door that said uh, had a post-it note on it that said "push here." <laughs> um, and, uh, and kind of deep in, in this idea is this uh, concept of affordances from a uh, branch of psychology uh, called ecological psychology. But basically when you, when you have people in the, in the world doing things, right? How things are designed um, kind of uh, affords people certain actions with, with those objects in the world. And we're talking about programming a lot of the time that, uh, that is represented in like the names of functions. And so um, ideally we don't want function names that like um, that suggest something that's like the opposite, right? Uh, uh, about what it can do uh, as compared to what you can actually do with the function or, um, you know, a situation where there's not descriptive, um, where you don't really know what it's supposed to do just based on reading the function name and the code, some sample code. Um, and so, when we're talking about uh, the tidyverse, the, the, the authors have tried to incorporate a lot of these like, kind of human-centered design principles in, in the design of these uh, packages. Um, and so a common data set that people talk about is this empty cars data set. You can you know, load it and you know, use it in any um, R Studio uh, R session that where you load the tidyverse. Um, it's just basically a data set of, of cars and information about those cars. So uh, miles per gallon, uh, uh, horsepower, I actually don't know what some of these are. Um, and there's this question of, okay, so if you have this data set and you want to arrange them in, these in ascending order uh, based on um, miles per gallon and the gear variables, how do we do this? Um, and so in, in, um, in uh, dplyr, um, you have this arrange function um, that takes a data frame and a column name, um, and so that you, you know, you, this will uh, do what you are setting out to do up here. So, for this empty cars data set, you're arranging it um, in ascending order by gear and then by miles per gallon. And so, if you ran that, you would get uh, kind of a reordered uh, data frame. Um, and so, so this example kind of shows it shows an instance where you have a name of a function that's descriptive and explicit. So, just from the name arrange, you kind of get a sense for what you what you can do with it, um, what the what it, it affords you. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of these functions are verbs. So we talked a little bit a second ago about like pivot longer and pivot wide, pivot wider um, from the tidy R package. Right, like it's telling you what you can do with it, what you can do with the function instead of some kind of abstract theoretical name that doesn't really give you a sense for what like what actions you can take with it. Um, so um, another uh, 
uh, concept from the design principles is this idea of reusing existing data structures. Um, and so in the tidyverse, you're most often op like doing things with, with data frames or tibbles. Um, in uh, tidy models, one example of this and, and one neat, interesting or helpful thing about, about uh, tibbles and data frames is that you can have list columns. And so there can be columns that are actually um, lists of, of data frames. Um, so you can have like data frames in data frames. And it's just really helpful for a case like this where you're generating um, bootstrap samples. So you're kind of just like generating a bunch of samples that are randomly sampled from your original data set um, uh, for something like, like model tuning or training. Um, and each, uh, each uh, row here uh, is actually um, uh, a data frame in, in and of itself. So each split. Um, so that you can then use that and just like run a model on it and uh, evaluate your results. Um, and then, so in, in this case, it's a, the class is a bootstrap class for this, um, for this uh, uh, data frame here. And once you do things like training and testing, uh, where you're kind of pulling out, you can, you can use those functions on that type of, uh, that the state of frame of a bootstrap class uh, in order to uh, generate your tests and training sets and things like that. Um, let's see what else. Okay, that's good for now. Feel free to stop me at any time. Um, okay, and then another principle uh, the tidyverse is that most all the functions are um, from these different packages are designed with the pipe operator in mind. Um, so the most important thing to know about the pipe operator is that it uses the value of the object um, on the left hand side of the operator as the first argument on the operator's right hand side. Um, so oftentimes you have a, a data frame and you're kind of manipulating it in a few different steps and each time the updated uh, data frame object is passed to the next step as the as the first argument of the next step. And so in this case, you have that, you have the empty cars data set. Here, it's implicitly passed. And so the data argument that we saw a second ago for the range function um, is uh, passed via this pipe. Uh, and so in this case, it's the empty cars data set. Um, and then you're arranging it by gear. And then again, once it's arranged, uh, you're passing that updated data frame to the first argument of slice, and then you're just taking the, which takes the first 10 rows of that arranged data frame. Um, all right, and then this point here that uh, this approach with the pipe works well because uh, all the functions return the same data structure. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be true, um, but it often is. Um, and then, yep. And then, whenever possible, these these functions uh, can be, you know, in the tidyverse should be able to be incorporated into a pipeline of oper operations like this. Um, oh, and I wanted to um, show one example. Uh, sorry, I had it up and I uh, had it on my Twitter. Um, but uh, I thought th this is a really great example of like why piping is useful. Um, so. If you were to have a kind of a sequence of events where you're you're the kind of the data object, um, and you were wanted to go through the steps of like waking up, getting out of bed, getting dressed, and leaving the house, if you didn't have piping, you would have to have this really ugly um, kind of nested uh, arrangement of functions where you, the first thing you want to do is on the innermost layer, and then you kind of like work at your way out. But if you have pipes, you just kind of you do one operation, pass the updated object to the next step, and then it's it's much more readable. Um, and that's a kind of a general point about the tidyverse that I thought was interesting from rereading some of the tidyverse book um, was that yeah. uh, was that uh, can, can you, that sorry. Can you share the link for the tweet? Someone is asking. Um, can you share the link for the? Oh for sure. The, uh, the tweet? Yeah, sure. I can do that right now. Um, Thanks. Sure. Um, okay. Maybe I'll, oh, okay. I lost my chat window. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, great. 
Um, and so that was actually a really interesting point I thought from the Tidyverse book was that they talk about like first they want it when they're designing a new function or you know, you know some kind of new um, functionality of a, of a Tidyverse package. They think first about how to get this working so that it works and someone who's a human can like understand it and work with it and generally it's like usable. And then afterwards, they look at the bottlenecks and try to make it faster. Um, and I think just that's a really interesting philosophy. I think that's that some, you know, it's not only exists, doesn't only exist in the tidyverse, but but it, um, I would say, uh, it is you see it throughout um, the tidyverse and just in terms of the, the realization of some of these principles. <sighs> okay. Um, so another uh, aspect of the tidyverse uh, that we'll use a lot in, um, I think, in, in tiny models framework is this idea of functional programming. Um, and so oftentimes in functional programming, you want to replace an R, especially. Uh, it's really helpful, especially for the readability of code, um, to replace uh, iterations that you normally do in a for loop with um, a lot of functions that come from this per package. Um, so in this case, uh, you have a kind of common or uh, operation where you're trying to uh, uh, get the square root of um, this mile, miles per gallon uh, attribute for every single car in this empty cars data empty cars data set. And so in this case, you're just going to do that for as many times as there are um, as many times as there are rows. And um, and yeah, as you saw before, each row represents uh, a car. Um, and so one way you could do that is by like initializing an empty vector that's the length of the number of rows that you want to do this for. Um, and then just um, kind of indexing it and assigning the value as a result uh, based on what row you're on. Um, but uh, another way you could do this is by defining a function uh, in this case called my square root, where it takes a, a miles per gallon and a weight. So in this case, the weight is two um, and outputs you know, the, the results uh, for your square root function. Um, and so once you have this kind of simple function defined, uh, you can pass it to map or kind of there's a whole family of these types of functions where the first argument is like the, the vector or the thing that you're iterating over. And the second argument is the um, function that you're doing in each step. And it reduces kind of something that, that looks like this, uh, where you have to like pre-allocate a vector, you have a for loop um, to something that looks like this, where it's like one line, you just say kind of what you're, what you're iterating over and what you're doing at each step. And then it outputs, if you're using map, uh, your output's a list of values, um, but you can also use a bunch of other uh, map family functions that, you know, if you use map chr, stands for character, you're outputting a character vector, um, map double, your uh, or dbl, you're outputting a, a, a numeric vector, and then logical lgl. Um, and I often use this map dfr function, um, that's also really helpful and it'll out output a, a data frame. So it basically allows you to bind a bunch of results that are in, the, in a list that are all data frames into one data frame together, which is nice. Um, and then you can also do things with more than one vector at a time. And so we're kind of going, iterating through, uh, 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 you know, two different vectors, for instance, where you want the value at each step from the index that you're on in each vector. Um, to be passed to your function in case in this case and you wanted to do different weights. Um, all right. Okay, and so tibbles are a lot like data frames, but there are some um, differences um, that we talked a little bit about in this chapter. Um, so uh, one example is that tibbles work with column names that aren't syntactically valid variable names. Um, and so in the data frame, if you have like spaces in your column name, it'll just add periods instead of those in place of those spaces uh, because it doesn't like variable names that have uh, spaces in them. But if you were to do that with the tibble, um, it just kind of gives it to you as you gave it and it works. Um, 
Tibbles also prevent partial matching of arguments. Uh, this can be a common source of errors. So like if you're using a data frame and you have a column named partial, if you just write DF part, it'll kind of guess that you're trying to refer to DF to, to the partial column name. Um, but uh, but if you're not, you know, or if you have code where you've made a mistake, like that could lead to an error if there's like multiple names that like are similar in some in kind of how they're spelled, for instance. With tibbles, it actually just gives you a warning and a null result if you do that. It won't do partial matching. Um, tibbles also prevent like dim dimension dropping. Um, let's see, sorry. So subsequently the single column will never return a vector. Um, I see. So uh, with uh, data frames, if you subset um, a column, you'll get a vector of values. With the tibble, you get a if you do that same thing, you get a tibble in return. Um, uh, so it's not going to change the data type by indexing a certain column. Okay, and then you can also have list columns and tibble, which we just talked about. And a lot of the time, this is useful for uh, per type functionality, where you're you know, you're applying a function to a list of data frames. Um, sometimes you like you've trained a bunch of models, you put them in the list, and then you use, you can use per. Oh, we have kids here. <laughs> you can see them over there. Hey, Ella. I'm giving a presentation, so. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. Let's do this. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Um, and so the last part here is reading and wrangling data. Um, so to get started with the tidyverse, you want to know how to read in data. Um, let me just move upstairs. One second. Yeah. All right. Quieter. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, oftentimes, you know, you want to use like a read R uh, function for reading CSVs from, in this case, from a URL. You're selecting data, changing, you know, creating a new column, um, grouping, and summarizing. Um, and so that's the kind of the basic workflow of a lot of tasks. Um, won't go into that too much, but I have all this code in my R Studio console. If you want to uh, talk about any of this later. Um, and so I also listed out um, some of these uh, things that I think are related or helpful for this chapter. Um, this is referenced in the Tidyverse uh, book as well, but the design of everyday things um, by Don Norman um, talks a lot about uh, uh, this design thinking concept and the idea of, um, of uh, you know, like, how to build things that are useful to people and that that fit with how people are do do things in the world and think rather than just like um, exist as unusable objects. Um, super interesting. Uh, Teddy versus design principles. This is a book that I really like as well. Um, this visualization and analysis design book. Um, it has a framework for specifically for data visualization, but. Um, in my mind is kind of like a human centered design approach to doing data visualization. Um, it also draws on research and cognitive science, which I like. Um, and then from the tidyverse design principles, chapter two, um, they talk about these three kind of influences on the tidyverse design philosophy. And so you have the Unix philosophy, the Zen of Python, and this other link about, I guess, a language called small talk, which I'm not familiar with. Um, Okay, and then I would suggest working through some of these, just reading through, I thought it was pretty interesting. I've never seen some of these design guidelines of these other languages before. Um, and you'll see a lot of this show up in some of these tidyverse principles. Um, like I'll just pick out one here that I think is interesting. Um, where is it? Oh yeah, uh, prototype before polishing, get it work before you get it working before you optimize it. I, I often fall into that trap where I'll try to like build some complex thing and then they don't know where to start when it doesn't work. Um, but, but I thought those were good reads. Um, 
and yeah, so that's it here. I had an idea about talking through some of the some future tidy models code um, with these principles in mind. But um, does anyone have any questions or comments uh, based on what I've presented? That was super informative. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks um, a lot. Um, I, I had a question so in, in the chat talking. The um, using the double colon for namespace stuff. So oh, in the yeah. example there, it uses it for deplier and you know read our stuff. How how do you feel about doing that? Do you always do it? Are you mm -hmm. kind of religious to it or not very much? Um so I use it um, sometimes I'm lazy and like when like I use Lubridate for instance like I use it in almost every script but I find it annoying to like write include yeah. it in like a library function every time so I just like do Lubridate blah blah, blah but it gets really long and um, I started just importing it like every time um, I, I saw something Hadley tweeted about recently where someone like had an example where they had the colon colon and the package name and he was like, why don't you just import it? Like, why, why, why do you do that? Uh, <laughs> and so I, I had been doing that a lot, uh, referring to it explicitly. Um, the time, I guess, when I do it the most is like, or I started building a package. I had never, this is new to me, but, but um, building a package for work for internal stuff. And, um, and I find it useful there because you're just importing that one uh, function that you're using rather than like the entire package uh, for everyone who uses your package. Um, so I use it there, uh, but yeah, I don't know. What do others think about referring to things explicitly like that? It's also good if you don't have, um, if you don't use the con conflicted package for, um, for, especially with the tidyverse being so large, there's always a conflict with similar names and other pack, similar function names from other packages. So if you don't load it um, and use con the conflicted package, you have to call it explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, that makes me, reminds me of, I've had a lot of cases where with dplyr select, uh, I've had like that conflict, that package conflict problem, um, because it's, you know, uh, as you mentioned, like kind of, uh, you, you get stuff in your namespace based on, you know, like what select is gonna refer to is like the order, based on the order of the packages that you loaded. And sometimes I load something first that uses a function called select, because it's like pretty common. And I like, want to throw my computer against the wall because I'm like, how in the world is like select now working? Like I know that there's a function, there's a column name, name station or whatever. And like I fiddle with it for like 30 minutes and then realize that, oh man, like it's because it's a namespace conflict. Um, so that's a really good yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have that with filter a lot. <laughs> if I've forgotten to use library at the beginning, I'm like, what is going on with this filter? It's so annoying because the error you get isn't like you get an error that's related to the, the function that's conflicting and like the thing you yeah. passed not working rather than the conflict itself. And um, yeah, Sorry. that's why I find the conflicted package really helpful. Um, I used to uh, I used to really be reluctant to use it because I hate I try to reduce the number of library libraries I load at the top of my script. But a friend of mine was like constantly using it and it'll explicitly tell you what two functions are conflicting. So there's no, um, there's no question. Yeah, your exact example here with uh, filter. <laughs> That's really cool. I've, I haven't used it before, but thank you. That's uh, looks like it's just on GitHub, maybe. I thought oh, it was through. part of the tidyverse, I'm not sure. Cool. That's, that's fun awesome. now. Is it? Okay. I tended I, to use the. Uh, much. Go ahead. No, sorry, I'm done. Um, I tend to use the colons, and I just went and put like two letter snippets uh, in the snippet editor 
for all of the packages that I use regularly. So I can type like DP and then tab it and it'll be dplyr colon colon or like LU and that becomes lubricate colon colon. Oh, and so really typing cool. it out becomes a lot faster. Is that in our studio with the snippets thing or? Uh... Yeah, in our studio, the snippet editor. I think it's under like tools or something, or maybe it's in their preferences. Yeah, tools, project, global options. Oh, cool. I've never used that. So and the line's really long though, always. It's under using code. It. Yeah, it does. You'll definitely have more code. Um, oh, here we go, it, code snippets there. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so you can make uh, any like characters turn into whatever you want it to turn into. And I just put all the like packages that I use all the time, like per and Lubridate, Dplyr and whatnot in there. That's really, That's really cool. That, um, that almost reminds me, I know it's not the same, but of in Python, it's common to be like, you'd say import pandas as PD and then just use the abbreviation later on when calling functions. I know it's not the same because it, it auto completes. Um, I, I wish we that. had that functionality. Yeah. I feel like Dude, I, saw, I saw something recently uh, where they, it was like a, a new update, I guess. I don't know if it's R, but um, where you can say like import only. Uh, I think um, because because they were talking, well, they were talking about not the naming part, but the functionality where you can say like from pandas import re TSV or whatever. Um, so you can only take a part of a package, which is neat. Um, I think I think there's a new feature somewhere. I need to look it up again, or you could do that in R as well. Um, but. I know there's import from namespace, which I think is base, which allows you to import certain functions. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I have to look and look it up. Um, um, Does anybody here actually prefer base to the tidyverse? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically how I feel. It's so like there's so much ambiguity and functions behave differently in different contexts. And it's like really difficult to debug because the errors are so obtuse and the documentation is like completely like it's like, who reads this? Like, I can't understand it. I could go on, but I'm not a fan of base. Yeah, but it does have performance uh, on its side, doesn't it? It cases. does. Yeah, yeah I think it's... Um... Sorry, go ahead. Go for it. I was just going to say that, uh, yeah, I in the Tidyverse book, they mentioned, uh, I think it was the subsetting example. Um, and in base, if you do that using just like indexes and uh, it's, it's, it is a lot, it is faster than um, like using filter, for instance. Yeah, there's definitely some instances where if it can be done in base and it's legible and easy to understand what's happening, then I'll, then I'll use it uh, just for the computational speed. But there's like the cognitive demand of having to maintain that code that comes later. So that's always something to think about too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, speaking of cognitive demand, this is something I've thought a lot about recently with, um, in re with respect to functional programming. Um, I started looking into this package called Targets. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it basically allows you to make, oops, that's not what I want. <laughs> Um, allows you to make like uh, like pipeline kind of workflows in your analysis projects. Um, uh, this isn't a good example here because it doesn't have a diagram. Um, sorry, but but anyway, um, like it kind of really encourages you to make kind of each major step of what you're doing in an analysis a function that kind of stands alone. Um, and then, um, and then you can like create a pipeline that that you that has like you can branch and do all kinds of cool things with it. Um, but 
I find that doing that and kind of just the idea of, of trying to make a bunch of steps like chunks as functions really helpful for like the cognitive load aspect. Um, kind of just, just kind of thinking about a portion of your code and like one function that has a clear name uh, makes, I don't know, for me, it helps me kind of think through what I'm actually doing. Um, yeah, I've recently started doing that, like whatever logically comes to me as the next step, you know, which is usually broken down into like eight or nine steps when you actually write the code is like writing a function for that. And I'm wondering how, like, how does target our targets uh, encourage you to do that? Like, what, what does it do to, to facilitate that? Yeah, um, so it's a lot. I don't know if anyone has used Drake. I, I didn't use Drake before, uh, but it's 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 kind of the successor to it. Um, I'm trying to find uh, this, this some really good examples, but right now I'm not clicking on the right thing. Um, this might be. Uh, here we go. This is better. Um, so basically, you can. It, it allows you to. Um, okay. So uh, you have each of these steps, or let's see, each of these steps is either uh, like a, a function or like some kind of data object. Um, and, uh, and you basically the end result is a pipeline like this that you can run. And if you update any piece of the pipeline, it knows what to rerun that, that's been updated and everything that depends on it based on like your, this tree here. Um, and in order to create that, uh, you basically, uh, sorry, um, you create a bunch of targets. And so like here you have a create plot function that, that's like one target. And, um, and you say like what the name of that target is and what the function is that, that um, and then based on like what you're using as an argument in each function, it kind of knows what your kind of dependency like tree looks like and then, if you've like, you know, updated your histogram code, but you haven't updated raw data or data or raw data file, then it'll rerun. It'll only rerun the histogram code um, with kind of a. Uh, it saves like a serialized version of all of these steps um, in the environment, so that it'll only rerun this and it'll be like super fast. Um, but but yeah, I've just started like looking into it. But it um, anyway. Uh, kind of interested in that idea or talking about functional programming and another cool thing is that you can it'll allow you to like run things that aren't dependent on each other in parallel um so that mm. so that you can like run these two things at the same time uh without having to wait on one even though, but, but it doesn't really depend on on fit right histogram is just like it, they both just depend on data um so that's interesting that sounds super useful yeah, I, I find myself like either writing super complex scripts that like just have everything in them. And then I end up rerunning a lot of stuff just because I don't want to think about it again. Um, uh, and don't want to think about what I need to rerun and what I don't need to rerun. Um, uh, but, but also like in, in that process, I end up doing something expensive, like repulling a ton of data that I should just save and then use in a pipeline. And if I update things, just like remake the pipeline. Like I, I think that's a really cool idea. Um, so. Yeah, it reminds me about how our markdown, like when you knit, it like caches all the different things and then it watches to see which ones you changed and only reruns if it needs to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a similar idea. Um, yeah, one thing I want to ask you all when I was going through this is like, in your programming experience, either with R or the different language, like what are some cases where, if you have any examples where you've like run into uh, like a case where either something was super unclear about what you could do with a certain function or script or um, or it did something that you, and you thought it should do like the opposite of, of what you, like what, basically what are, like this Norman Dorr idea, what are some of those examples, if you can think of any in, in your own programming experience? Mode, of course, the infamous mm. mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think uh, when I'm lazy, I all write function names that are like just like letters or something or test. Um, I'd say that's a bad a example of bad code for my own life, but um, um, yeah. Okay, so one of the last thing I wanted to do was like basically just take these principles. Let's see if I can get them on the same screen. One second. I'm trying to. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. Right, I promise I'll get in one second. All right. Um, so this is just code from later, uh, chapter eight actually. But I thought it'd be interesting to kind of look, take a look at a complete, somewhat complete pipeline of like going from data reading to um, in tidy models to uh, fitting a model and like how or how not are these principles exhibited in this code on the right. Um, can you all see it? There's a too small. Um, is that okay? Can you see it? Yeah, it's a good size. Yeah. Um, so one thing I just noticed, like I have used this package a little bit, so it's kind of cheating. Um, probably better if you don't know what uh, some of these things are or, or you haven't used it before because it'll it's a good test for, I guess, how readable and uh, this this these functions are and what they suggest you could do with them. Um, but one thing I think I see a lot in the tidy models package in terms of compost, uh, composable, uh, or no, sorry, uh, yeah, it's not even here. I was thinking about extendability. So like being able to link up to other packages in the, in the R or tidy models universe. Um, is this uh, set engine? argument here. And so like a lot of the time with tidy models, if you're defining a model, you have some kind of a function that you're using and then you can utilize like other packages within uh, the tidy models ecosystem or our ecosystem as like the kind of the back end that's like actually implementing that function. And so like Ranger or like, you know, the linear model um, LM function, um, uh, you know, are, are different arguments you could put here in this, depending on what kind of model you're using in the set engine uh, argument. So I think that's one big goal I see in, in reference to these principles in the tidy models architecture is like being able to reference and pull in uh, all this functionality that's kind of scattered across our universe into one consistent kind of syntax uh, where you can, you know, just say set engine and you utilize a variety of different packages. Um, I don't know. Anyone else have any comments in relation to these principles, like from just looking through some of this code? Um, yeah. And so I have a question, and it doesn't relate sure. to the principle, but um, I wrote the question in the chat, and I oh, think sorry. Gave, gave the answer, and I wasn't sure if I understand it correctly. Uh, why do we have this doll in front of the name of the data, arrange the data? Why this doll? Um, sorry, where, oh, oh, okay. In, in the example we looked at earlier, right? Uh, the range example. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe the answer to that is because, um, I think it's because it's usually in the, in tidy, in like the tidy verse, it's like a, the data argument is like an implicit argument. It automatically gets passed uh, from the thing before it that you were working on, the data frame you were working on in the pipeline and in the pipe. Um, uh, so it's not something you usually have to explicitly like set if you're using, if, but if you're just using a range by itself without kind of a pipeline of data frame of a data frame that you're, you're passing to it, you have to define it explicitly. And so that would be the only case that I can think of where where, and, and I think the dot just signifies that it's like an implicit argument, but, but anyone else have any, Thoughts on that? Um, I might be I might be wrong about that. That's just my best guess or best answer. I think that might be their reasoning. The dot itself is like R allows for dots in names in object names, and so like the simplest possible object name you can have in R is just like period, 
just like dot, and you can assign that as a variable. And when you use the dot as a prefix to any variable name like dot data, it is considered hidden. And so you won't see it in the environment browser, but it is actually available in the environment. So like if you go to the console and you call like dot data or whatever your dot uh, name is for your object, it will still like print the object um, because it's still there. It just doesn't show up in your environment. Uh, so at least for when I code, I found it's helpful when you have when you're writing a function and you have intermediate variables inside the function that aren't really pertinent inputs or outputs, you can make all of the um, intermediates dot something or whatever you want to name it. And you will keep your environment browser clean. Uh, so you just see like your inputs and your outputs to the function rather than all the intermediates. I don't remember what the, it's called, what this, um, I had attended a workshop some time ago where they were talking about dot notation and I find it really useful. Uh, I don't assign anything explicitly to the dot, but it's really helpful in the pipe. So you don't even have to even state your object. You just put dot dollar sign var name um, and I use it actually, I, where I use dot a lot is in, um, iteration. So within per, uh, it's really clean. Like I think in my opinion, it, it may be confusing for somebody that is a little bit more novice, but once I learned that that's a thing, I was just, there's dots all over my code. <laughs> Yeah, um, just to show what, uh, what um, uh, Layla, Le Layla, sorry, uh, was just uh, mentioning, like, if you ever want to refer explicitly to the object that's being passed through the pipe, you can just use dot. Um, and so that helps in cases where uh, where you um, where you want to use a function in a pipe that isn't like a tidy function. So the the argument. Um, to the function that you're using as the next step doesn't take a data frame as the first argument. Um, that's often a uh, case as well as, as you mentioned, like with per, um, where you are defining anonymous functions. Uh, let me just go to that. I think it's actually, yeah, so here we go. So with per, like if you have uh, one argument and you use an anonymous function, which is just this function that's not named anything that's that's set up with this tilde, um, either dot or dot x, uh, you will, yeah. will, will give you the, the object. Exactly. Um, okay, so I know we just went over like a tidyverse primer for, for all you smart tidyverse people in here. So um, when I'm teaching, is it safe to say that in by design, a typical tidyverse function will always have your dot x, which is your data object, as the first argument, and then followed by, and then I can just say dot dot dot, like subs, like whatever um, relevant actions, like the func part. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I think it's often data. It's not, it's not always data, but it's like whatever the primary thing the function is acting on is definitely always the first. Yeah. I mean, like something like, like a string R function, um, it's not going to be, well, it's like a, it's data, but it's not like it's a string or a string vector. Like it's not necessarily a data frame. Um, and I would say that's a tidyverse function. Yeah, I guess any anything that you would want to put into a pipe is going to have data as like a, a first argument. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's the best thing <laughs> I think I can, I can give. Um, yeah, anything, okay. yeah, anything 
I think there's, <laughs> other, I guess there's other things. Never mind. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, sorry. I'm there's... looking at a list now of all the tidyverse uh, packages, and I'm just looking at it and like that. What I just said doesn't make sense, especially for like Reprex and Arling. Like, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some things like that, like Arling, will support your ability to create. Uh, like it's like the underlying grammar, I guess, for like the creation of tidy, uh, tidy function functions and packages. Um, so, so yeah, I guess that's how that fits in. Um, I guess it's just how I frame it because when I teach for these student for students who are very very new at R, and you know, it's mostly just the the five main deplier verbs. That's like. I think it's a pretty safe bet. Getting into the into the weeds of some of these tidyverse packages is probably would be more advanced. I just want to get you your those thoughts. How I phrase this for beginners? Um, yeah. So um, now I've checked, arranged uh, some by default. We have dot data dot by group. Um, currently still, I'm not yet fully understand the dot here. We have dot data dot. I mean, why this dot can, please can you run maybe a little bit example to show why do we have this? I'm not really get <laughs> understand why we have this dose. And if, for instance, is it the same if I have arranged, I put data equals X without a dot and by group, without using dot, is it the same? Why do we use the dot if they are the same? So, and I think in the rate, case of a range, like the dot is part of the argument name. So if you just did, uh, you just wrote data, uh, I don't think that would work. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's right. I, I think it's, it is, it is tricky. I, and I, I, don't, I don't find it the most intuitive. For example, that map statement on the left, I don't think it looks that, sensible or that we're talking about cognitive load. I think for me, I have to have to spend a while working that out. Um, I think it might be simple to think of the dot as it's, it's something that you don't need to specify because it has a hidden argument already, as in it has a default position. And that's just the tidyverse way of, if they say they put a dot in front of it and it's part of the variable name, that dot. And it's just saying, you don't need to specify this each time there is a default value but i don't know that that's true <laughs> i'm just thinking based off that example of deplier yeah. uh, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a default value for the variable um it i think it sometimes i think like kevin said is because it could it's a thing that gets piped in but i mean like for map and everything they all have dots i think it's just a convention um, for keeping the namespace segmented into uh, function or like objects that are dot and kind of hidden and objects that are uh, visible or like otherwise I'm not I'm not exactly sure internally why they chose that convention but Another another case where you often or I see I, I use this bind rows function a lot. I just like this is not a real object, but if, if you had a list of data frames and you want to turn them into one, you can use this bind rows function and like um and the ID argument here where you say like what uh what you want if you if you want an ID column that like is the name of um each object in that list. Um, you can use this dot ID argument and you could say like whatever uh, user, if it's a user for each data frame. Uh, but yeah, this is also dot here. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't I don't know if there's a general, I'm not really sure what that convention is to be honest um, in this case. Um, you can also maybe. use the dot in a, uh, as Layla was saying, like in a pipe, if you want to create a segment of the pipe that uses a nested function structure, because that's the way you think about that step, you can use brackets in the pipe 
and you can use the dot to put your object that you're piping in uh, wherever you want inside of that nested function structure. Yeah, and you can also do something weird like this where you're like, you're like doing something in base R that's piped through, like, you know, you're indexing it with the dollar sign. Um, because you know, this dot refers to the data frame. Um, or you can do a, or you can do this to I think. Um, is there any way to um, um, refactor code written in base R to change it to tidy bars? Uh, definitely, yeah. I would say anything you can do in base R, you can refactor to tidyverse. No, I mean, do you have I mean, as if you have an existing code that is written in base R, and you sure. want to use maybe a function or some way to just automatically um, uh, change it to tidyverse uh, principle. Is there any package that can do that? Mm. That like re recodes your code, uh, um, like automatically. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. I don't know of any that does that, but uh, I, I I think there's a lot of like for manual. I think they're doing it manually. There's a lot of like um, cheat sheets. Like uh, our studio has a lot of these. Um, I just looked up base R to tidy verse cheat sheet. Um, I don't know, like a lot of people have stuff like this. I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but um, yeah, I don't know. Does anyone know any, any way to do that? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's a specific kind of switch. Um, maybe because there are mul there are multiple ways of doing things in any in any specific way as well. So it's not a unique problem. Yeah, I mean, people have like little examples and stuff, you know. If you wanted to take out, like extract a variable, uh, yeah, people just have resources, I think, to, to do that manually. Um, but if you learn some metaprogramming, then, or if you know metaprogramming, then I guess you could do that. Because um, there are, I don't know how many of you all are in the advanced art group, but um, there's a lot of examples of R packages that translate R code into another language. Uh, so. It's definitely possible. I just don't know of a package that does that. Um, but there's like you know DB plier that translates R into SQL, um, and also other stuff that he just does an example here where it's translating into HTML. Um, but um, also another quick question. Um, so um, I don't know what is the best principle. For instance, um, sometimes you see people um, load libraries. What is the library? Um, um, Tidyverse and they just um, call the fun any function from Tidyverse. And what about, I mean, using, for instance, um, uh, deplier, you put two columns and use the function. Uh, I share what I mean. I mean, which one is the best approach? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. that's what we yeah. were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I I, I try to load libraries and then just refer to the function, you know, or use just the function name. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I think there are cases if you just want to refer to one function or if there's a namespace conflict as uh, Layla uh, mentioned earlier um, that you can do the, do it with the colons to so that you, you tell R which version of that function or which package you want to use. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I've come across such cases, I think, um, yeah, where there is some kind of conflict and using that sales. So um, um, it's preferable to load the libraries first and if there is such conflict, you use this uh, format, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in my what I think about when I see code like this is I think that it, as a general principle, it's probably good if you're repeating something over and over again to figure out a way not to do that. Um, like if you're saying, you're saying dplyr in front of all these functions, it, if there's a way with, I guess, with lo loading the library uh, first, um, you wouldn't have to do all that repetition. 
then I would say that would probably be the preferred way to do it. Yeah. Um, in most cases, because yeah. uh, it also just it doesn't give you any new information and it kind of jumble jumbles up your code a little bit like like it would be, it, I think if you wanted someone if you were sharing this code with someone and you wanted them to know what you were trying to do. Right. I would just it would be preferable, at least to me, to lead with the verb that you're using instead of the um, the namespace or the package. Thank you. And I think that idea also goes back to the functional, a lot of concepts and, you know, functional programming, right? Like you don't want to repeat yourself too much. And if you find yourself writing some code over and over again, like three times or whatever, then you'll probably want to write a function and do some kind of iteration on it. Um, um, okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention that uh, I forgot to mention about tidying up data is that there's some cases where uh, you don't want tidy data because of like the format that the function requires. And so one case of that, I, I find that a lot in like, like models in are in a lot of different languages, but um, like if you, uh, if you, um, if you have a categorical variable and uh, you want to use, use it in a function, in a, in a, a model algorithm architecture that requires all of your variables to be numeric, you can like recode them in a wider format um, using like dummy variables or one hot encoding. Um, and that is making your data wider, but you have to because of the, the requirement of the input for that particular modeling technique. Um, so that was the last thing I wanted to say that it's not always the case that you want tidy data. Um, is one hot where you have like, you're using all the data and then you're predicting on one observation. Um, so it's like if you have uh, basically if, if you have um, a categorical variable like uh, like uh, you know region or something, and you wanted to use that, you instead of having one variable called region, you would have. Um, uh, you make a, bu a bunch of new variables for every level in that, or every level minus one, I think, in that um, in that variable. So you would have a new one that's like east, north, central, west, and just have a binary value, so like zero or one. Um, so if Got it's it. like if it is the east, then you just make it one, and then everything else is zero. Um, I believe that's the correct definition, but uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong about that. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that before. I didn't know it was called one hot. Yeah, I guess I don't quite know if there's a difference between dummy encoding and if there's just if it's just a different name for because in machine learning people often talk about one hot encoding, and I'm not sure if that's any different than creating d dummy variables, but. Um, might be just the machine learning term for it. Uh, that's why I had thought about it, but. Uh. Cool, thank you for presenting. Sure. Uh.